Uh, welcome to the MIT Communications Forum. Uh, we have a really exciting forum for you today. Uh, we're very excited to have our speakers here. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Christina Couch. I'm the program administrator for the forum here. Um, we wanted to warn you, please no flash photography during this event. Uh, our event is being taped, and there will be video and audio recording available on our website. Um, before we get started, I wanted to introduce our moderator this evening. Uh, she's the Associate Professor of Literature here at MIT. She's also Assistant Director of our Communications Forum and author of Artful Dodgers, Reconceiving the Golden Age of Children's Literature. Uh, please welcome Mara Gubar. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for coming. Um, so our format today, as per usual with the Com Forum, is very conversational. Um, so I have some questions for the panelists, and we'll talk until about 6 o'clock. And then, and either of you can feel free to chime in, too, at, at, at any time, um, if you have a thought. And then we'll open to the floor to your <laughs> questions. <laughs> we'll open the floor to your questions at 6 um, or so. OK, so first I'm going to ask our panelists, actually, to introduce themselves and tell us each a little bit about who they are and their work um, and how their career is related to the theme of women in politics. So Marianne, will you start? I'm Marianne Marsh. I'm a woman in politics. That's how <laughs> I qualified for this today. Um, I work, I'm a principal at the Dewey Square Group, which is a democratic consulting firm. Uh, we're best known for, uh, we're the preeminent firm in grassroots campaigns before grassroots was cool. Uh, we did grassroots. And I also am a political analyst for, um, and up here on the Fox News channel. As a Democrat, uh, I do WCVB here in Boston. I do WBZ Radio as well, Sky News in London, and my perhaps one of my favorites, uh, the Radio New Zealand is very big. <laughs> um, and so I've done um, tons of campaigns for longer than I want to admit, and uh, have worked with male and female candidates along the way. And um, you know, look forward to discussing all that with you this evening. Thank you so much. And Ellen? Um, I'm Ellen Emerson White, and I make up stories about these things. It's <laughs> not, I don't have any TV shows, I don't have any pundit experience, but when I was going to Tufts, I wrote a book about the daughter of the first female president, little realizing that many years later, not that many, we like to pretend, we just won't <laughs> go into the details, but we still don't have one. Wow, go figure. So, four books about the same character in a lot of research, a lot of and academic depth behind it, but I can't pretend to be a political expert because, you know, stories, jokes, entertainment, and fun. The, the, the year the president's daughter came out, right? Oh, yeah, I was a toddler, of course. But How no. old were you? Well, it's going to date me considerably, but I, sold, I was 19 when I wrote The President's Daughter. I finished it when I was 20. It came out when I was, yes, a year later. So don't do the math. You're at MIT, and you're probably very good at math. Uh, Geraldine Ferraro got nominated two months after the book came out. So it was a good timing. And everything looked very promising as far as our actual American political system. And yes, many years passed, and yeah. we saw what didn't happen. Marianne, why do you think it's taken so long? It's a great question, right? I mean, I think. To Ellen's point, I, and I got an honorary degree at my alma mater two years ago, and part of that speech was, I never thought it would, after all these years, there still wouldn't have been a woman elected to the, to the presidency. Inconceivable, especially in you know, electing Barack Obama first uh, as an African-American president. Terrific, great, wonderful. Um, but the fact that we haven't elected a woman yet says a lot. And when you look at across politics, I mean, women are 51, 52% of the population, and a fraction of Congress, a fraction of the governors, a fraction of state legislatures, up and down the political system, there are barely any women by comparison. And it's true in business as well. I mean, when you look at CEOs and you know, sitting on boards and all that stuff, that says a lot. And, and I think there are lots of reasons for it, um, but it's hard to ignore the fact that um, oftentimes less qualified men beat very qualified women on, on both sides, both as Democrats and Republicans. And I think that's a lot to grapple with. I think we, we may have the chance again to watch that sort of referendum uh, a year from now, pretty much, you know, uh, in 51 and a half weeks. 
um, and to see whether that <laughs> it feels it so much longer. I know, I mean, it will, it does. <laughs> um, and I think there are, are a multitude of reasons, um, cultural, um, I think religion still plays a lot of it into it, and, and, and go across economics, um, all of it. And I think one big difference um, I see constantly in campaigns is when men run, they only have to deal with their assets or challenges as individuals. When women run for office, they represent the entire gender, everything good or bad, in top of to, on top of their individual assets or deficiencies. And I think that's a very big challenge. And I will leave you on this note for now. Um, once again, it probably came as no surprise, but last night, um, you know, we had a Republican debate again. You know, the undercard, the big debate, and at the end of the debate on Drudge, which I don't know how many people here know about the Drudge Report but it's a website that feeds lots of news out there. And the featured thing on Drudge was Hillary Clinton's hair. Okay, and then the Google map of her hairdresser and where her salon is and what are, what's going on with her hair and all this stuff. And, and so I feel like in this case, you see that constant. I've had, I've had clients who've had the same challenges. You know, Hillary Clinton, nobody covered more, nobody vetted more, nobody challenged more, and no one whose hair has been discussed more than anybody <laughs> on this earth. And here we are in 2015, and that's exactly what was on the front page of Drudge. So I think that says a lot. Yeah, my goodness. So what? And it was an unkind photo. Was it? <laughs> there were it several. It was a very, but the one at the top with yeah, the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness, that, yeah. Ellen, do you want to do, do the honors? Um, so that's an old, old teacher's insight. Yes, yes. <laughs> my father's a retired professor. He would be appalled by my lack of mentioning it. Uh, 1984, Walter Mondale was not going to win the election against Ronald Reagan. So Geraldine Ferraro was a congresswoman from Queens, and she was nominated to be his vice president. And it got pretty ugly because her father was real estate in New York, which if you are from New York, you know, tends to be a complicated business. And she was really savage. Do you remember the press conference? You're not old enough. I'll we'll pretend no, I'm not old enough. No, I, I, I do remember. Yeah. yeah, and it was a very, it was a very strange, I mean, it was exciting, but I don't think anyone who was paying attention thought there was any chance they were going to, and when you tried to sell the president's daughter, your editor told you it wasn't realistic, right? Yeah, two years <laughs> earlier, they said, oh, no one's, no one's going to read this. You can't possibly make it remotely plausible. Uh, to have a woman running. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing about the books over the years, as I was telling you, is no one has ever mentioned that she's a woman. Ever. Not in a review, not in a conversation. They criticize her as a president. God knows they criticize her as a mother. Um, they never criticize her outfits because she dresses far better than I ever will. But yeah, it never came up that she was a woman because I've worked really hard to create the most plausible candidate with a background that I thought was electable. And were you inspired by actual female politicians? Had you any contact in politics before? What gave you the urge to write this? Was it a was it a feminist desire to see that in the world? Or like, where did it come from? Then? It was better than going to class. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there was nothing out there, no pop culture. I came, at, there had been one movie, and I am, I, I did not see this movie because it was 1964, but I caught up with it later, called Kisses for My President, starring uh, <laughs> Polly Bergen. Oh, someone's nodding, you saw the movie. <laughs> and it was appalling because she's, elected president and she serves and then Fred McMurray is her husband and he gets her pregnant and she steps down because she has a baby and that's too icky to be president. And that's the end of the movie and it's supposed to be a happy ending. And so that was the only pop culture female president when I was writing the book and there was one book, Jeffrey Archer, two books, Jeffrey Archer had done The Prodigal Daughter mm -hmm. and Shall We Tell the President and not a likable president, and Steve Dunleavy had done the very first first lady where she was Machiavellian and very, very scary. And that book tanked, but the Archer book did well. And that was it. No, I have no idea. I, uh, 
I was going to major in political science and then drama and then English and then drop out of it, you know. Mostly I went to movies, to tell you the truth. But, uh, and Red Sox games. That was pretty much me in college. And read books, okay. But there was absolutely nothing out there. And I had sold two other books to a New York publisher about other things. And when I came to them with this idea, they just said, oh, God, no. We can't possibly make money on that, no. So. And it's ironic, too, because it's a very realistic series in many ways, right? You know? So it's like, I think. Yeah, it definitely yeah. is. Yeah. Except it hasn't happened. Except for that part. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so uh, were you intentionally planning to write it as YA, as young adult literature? Or no. no you just wrote it and then they told you it was YA? Yeah. How did that work? I was 19. <laughs> you were a young adult. I was 19. So I, you know, the main character was a junior in high school. What do you, did you have I, I do remember I went, after the president's daughter came out, did pretty well. And they had me go to a speaking thing. And I got there early. It was very, very crowded. And it was a lot of women my mother's age. And I was shy. And I was just sitting in the corner with my coffee, kind of swinging my legs. And the editor came in. And they're like, where's the writer? The writer never showed. It's supposed to be starting. And the editor's saying, um, she's right there, sitting there. And they all turn around. The entire room, their faces fell. And they said, oh, you're the kid's age. We thought you were the president's age. We thought it would be real. Um, and then they apologized, and they were nice. And I gave my little talk in the whole nine yards. But they were very upset that I was the age of the main character. <laughs> I mean, the president is her mother. So it's a different thing. But yeah, they were really hoping it had come out of the ERA was still in the air then. Mm -hmm. I still can't believe they didn't pass the ERA. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, every college kid I know right now is pretty big on feminism, so I'm hoping things may, maybe, maybe we get another chance for that one. That's interesting. Is that your sense, too, as someone who advises candidates? About younger? Yeah. I mean, I, I do think younger students tend to be more progressive today. I think you saw that in the Obama campaign. You certainly see that in this campaign cycle, um, certainly not only with Clinton, but certainly with Sanders in particular. I think what worries me is that I think a lot of younger um, students and others, especially women, I think take, don't take seriously the real threat to things like abortion and abortion rights and a lot of other issues that I think really are at risk this election cycle and are at risk at the state level and a whole other bunch of things that at least we're old enough to remember that that wasn't always the case. Mm. Um, and I think a, a lot of younger women take a lot of those things for granted and don't realize that wasn't always the way and like this could go in this election cycle. And I think you also note that, especially on the Republican side, um, the disdain for um, Supreme Court rulings they don't like, presidential you know, executive orders they don't like, bills that are passed that they don't like and just decide to ignore. Mm. So I, I, I love the enthusiasm and progressive views of younger uh, voters and younger students. Um, and I love the energy they bring to campaigns and we covet them all. Um, but it, that is one concern I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wonder too, I, I don't know, my own experience teaching is that often people don't want to identify as a mm. feminist. Like, do you know what I mean? Which yeah. always puzzles me slightly. Um, and I'm wondering if this is what, how we connect this to the, to the question of like why has it taken so long and you know what kind of special challenges female candidates face. You know? So can you tell us, give us some like actual like particular stories of campaigns where you saw like sexism being a factor? I mean, they're endless. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean it, 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 it's from the, the most basic things to um, the really obvious things. So let me... Let me, I'll split them in half. Okay. Working with a candidate, every time I work with a woman candidate, I, I, I only do this with women, right? Let me look at your clothes. Let's look at your wardrobe. How do I like your hair? What color is your hair? We should change your hair. You know I mean? It's all about appearances first and foremost because women still are judged on them 
much more, almost exclusively, to the fact that men aren't. So you have, whether you like it or not, you have to do it because you don't want that to be an issue. You want people to focus on what's being said, what you're you know, supporting, what your positions are, but you have to get by that first. So you can't give voters an excuse. Mm. So I, I mean, with male candidates, I mean, I'll care about a tie maybe, you know, like, like what color shirt, what color, you know, but not to the great extent, right, that you do with women. It's, it's a, a full-time job in that respect. Or making sure they have makeup and hair done and all that before debates and, and all those things. Men do it too, and, you'd be, and most of them do, but mm -hmm. you, no one pays attention to that as much. Um, and then on the other side of it, there are things from um, male moderators at debates um, who ask questions that are worded in a way to a woman candidate, again, on abortion and others, that are stunning and jaw-dropping, and, and yet they're insistent that this is the way it is. Um, like, what do you mean? Well, I, I'd go back to, for example, I hate speaking of people who are no longer with us because they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? But there was um, a debate with a former client of mine, Shannon O'Brien, who was the, you know, ran for governor against Mitt Romney. Uh, I had worked with her when she ran for treasurer, believe it or not, in Massachusetts. And when she was elected, she was the first woman ever elected to statewide office in Massachusetts. In the, it took us to the 90s to do that. Wow. Okay, at, now everyone thinks Massachusetts is this great progressive bastion, right? It is not. I mean, Elizabeth Warren, I think, has helped that immensely, and a lot of women have gotten elected since she won the Senate race, and that was brutal. Um, but, you know, Tim Russert moderated a debate between Mitt Romney and Shannon O'Brien, and he went after her on abortion like I cannot tell you. And it was jaw-dropping. And that was a turning point in that race, on that exchange, on that topic. And I'll point to two others. Um, one, both have to do with Hillary Clinton. If you go back to when Hillary Clinton ran for the Senate in New York, and she had a debate with Rick Lazio, and there was the famous exchange when Rick Lazio went over to her with a piece of paper, walked over to her, she's at one podium, he's at the other, walks across, puts this in front of her, says, sign this, sign this, sign this now, I want you to sign this pledge. Well, that was the turning point in that race because every woman who saw that said, oh my God, that's my husband with the credit card bill. I can't believe this. I mean, he was, it was just so unbelievable. And that turned that race, and literally every woman went and voted for Hillary Clinton for Senate. Fast forward to a few weeks ago, and Hillary Clinton comes out and talks about gun control and how important it is and all that. Bernie Sanders then says, just shouting about gun control isn't enough. It's not going to change it. And in this case, a lot of women and Hillary Clinton said, why did you say shouting? What does shouting have to do with it? She's not shouting. And she then used that line herself in several forms, saying, you know, when, when, a woman sh when a woman shouts, she's not shouting, she's actually trying to get something done and saying it. So even someone as progressive as Bernie Sanders, here we are in 2015, um, you know, those aren't small things. People pick up on them. So I think that's something worth noting. Yeah, yeah. And you hear the words, shout was a gentle one. Shrill. Yeah. Cackle. Um, you know, those are the nice ones. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> you know, the things people say, you're thinking, God, that's kind of ugly. And, but a thing that troubles me, and mm -hmm. I would throw it back on the voters, is I can't even tell you how many times I've talked to someone about a female candidate for any office and had them say, oh, I'd vote for a woman. Just not that woman. Right. And then another woman comes along, totally different, absolutely different. And you say, well, what about her? And they say, oh, I'd vote for a woman. Not that woman. Right. And after a while, you, you know, I have more than one friend I've called out on this and said, what woman would you vote for? And they all say, oh, Catherine Powers, we, we vote for her. Like, <laughs> okay, she's power. imaginary, she's made up. What real woman <laughs> on the planet would you vote for? Um, Many dead women. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, if Ellen and Roosevelt were here now, they wouldn't vote for her. Right. <laughs> they would have plenty of complaints about, she would be uh, strident. That would be the word they would give her, I think. Um, and it's just the most encouraging thing to me that's happened in politics recently is in Canada, they just put together a 50-50 cabinet. This never happened. Can you imagine here? If we had a 50-50 cabinet, 50% 50 women, 50% men. And they hit <laughs> all kinds of different religious, disabled, this, that. I mean, he really. <laughs> God love him. He made a point of getting every Canadian represented, but 
We've never seen that in America or even right. anything close mm -hmm. to 50 percent. How could we get closer, do you think? I mean, I think part of it is... Take the, some of the money the, out of it. Well, uh, <laughs> could help a little bit. Women, women have always had a harder time raising money for a lot yeah. of reasons because um, they don't have the political contacts or the business contacts. Um, now you have super PACs, and we were talking about that a little bit before we started this. Um, I think culture is a large part of it, seeing women in those roles in culture, whether it's in books or in movies or TV um, or other forums. I think just electing more women helps more women get elected because uh, women see people in those roles. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I mean, Elizabeth Warren winning here really opened up the lid. I mean, that Catherine Clark then followed her. I mean, we've elected, you know, Maura Healy then came in as, you know, there are a lot of women now who are finally winning in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and across the country. But it takes, it, it takes a big effort, a lot bigger than it would for anything else. So I think the more women are seen in those roles, um, the bigger difference it's going to make. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, do women candidates, I feel like I'm trying to think of a, a happy question, <laughs> like do, do they have certain advantages yeah. as candidates as opposed to men? Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, polling and focus groups, vote ironically, which is, this, here's the big disconnect. People tend to trust women more. They, they believe them when they say something. So the, anyone who runs for office, the four steps you have to go through is that people have to get to know you and like you, first and foremost. Then they have to believe what you're saying. And the last piece is trust, right? So that's why you always hear the word trust at the end of every election. Do I trust that person to do what they say they're going to do? So they trust women. When they, women say they're going to do something, they believe and trust that women will actually get it done. Mm -hmm. They also believe that women are more likely to work together with other people, men, work with women, work with Democrats, work with Republicans. And you actually see that with the women senators in the United States Senate. They all go to dinner every six weeks together, Democrats and Republicans. They all work on each other's bills together. Even if they don't agree on things, they will work together. Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski will work with Kirsten Gillibrand or Elizabeth Warren on things and compromise to actually get things done. That's how it used to be with everybody. Mm -hmm. So I think the more that those things are seen and they all support each other um, in these efforts and they go on book tours together and do all kinds of things together, I think the more people see that, the better it is. But until you win that top slot, until a woman gets elected president, um, I think that will help to open up the floodgates more, but it's gonna be very tough to do, very tough. Yeah, well, which is maybe why it's good. At least we have it in fiction, right? <laughs> okay. At least we have Ellen giving us um, uh, Catherine Von Powers. So let me ask you a question, Ellen. I mean, again, this is to veer toward the sad, right? In the sense that what happens during the Von presidency, the Von Powers presidency, is is a lot of traumatic stuff goes down. So can you tell people who haven't read the series, give them a little sense of some of the stuff that happens and just say Part why of it you is me being way. a bad writer, you know. No. Let's, let's, no yes, <laughs> plotting, I'm weak. Um, but Aaron Sorkin did it on the West Wing, too. You, you, you're trying to tell a bigger story, but you need people to tune in. So Jeb Bartlett gets shot. She gets I mean, I did it 20 years before. I don't think he copied me, it's just what we do. Um, and there is a kidnapping, you know, God forbid such a thing would ever happen in the real world, but it was where I wanted to go with fiction. The thing I find sort of more disturbing, I'm just jumping to a slightly different topic for a sec. Okay. Because I was going over female presidents in pop culture. I was watching some of the shows and the movies and just doing some research this week, thinking about it. Almost none of them were elected on their own. Almost every single one of them, and think about any female president you've ever seen. Uh, the president dies. She takes over as vice president. They're not happy to have her. Maybe she should resign. Maybe she shouldn't take office. She didn't actually win. Her husband dies. She gets, she inherits a seat, she ends up president. Uh, all kinds of, <laughs> in the case of the, the one great, in my opinion, we were talking about this, female president, I think, in pop culture has been Laura Roslin on Battlestar Galactica, which you, if you <laughs> have not watched, you really must. Awesome show, yes. <laughs> but Laura Roslin is everything you want in a president. And 
it helps when you choose an Academy Award winning actor to play the part. <laughs> it's going to be that much better. But even in Laura Rosalind's case, they had to blow up everybody else. And she's something crazy. I can't remember where she is in succession. She's way back. I, I want. Yeah, but, it, but I can't remember the number. Is it like 80th or something? Yeah, or whatever she is, she's way yeah. back. But she happened to be on the ship because they were decommissioning the ship when the world blew up um, by the sidelines. Really good show. Uh, so even she didn't earn it. I think on 24 when Cherry Jones played that president, I think she was elected. An actual honest to God election. Hugh but Davis? Uh, Nope. President died, commander in chief. Commander yeah, not a huge favorite of mine, but I like Gina Davis. <laughs> but she was uh, asked to step down and not assume office so that Donald Sutherland, the Speaker of the House, who played it like snidely whiplash, could take the role. So and why is that, do you think? I, well, I think it is people have trouble imagining the reality of a woman who works her way up through the trenches and gives up a lot. Because you can't have it all. We all know this. There are things you're going to have to give up. If you do that, there are sacrifices you'll make. The core of my books about the female president are, I think she's a good mother, actually. I really do. But her family has taken most of the blows from her, I mean, she starts off, she's from Massachusetts, she starts off in the assembly, she gets a congressional seat, she ends up in the Senate. Uh, I, I think she's uh, one of the deputy whips to, when she's in Congress and then she jumps to Senate. And then suddenly in the first book, keeping in mind I was only 19, um, they want her to run because she appears to be viable, they do not want her to win. And she actually doesn't really want to win either. It, it, come, it comes as a bit of a surprise to her that she actually won the election. And, but she does it the old fashioned. It, it's the whole thing. She mm -hmm. goes through the primary. She goes through this. I did, did a little bit of a brokered convention because I just, I did. I thought it'd be more entertaining in the book. Mm -hmm. I like to think that wouldn't actually happen. But I was amazed when I went through pop culture that I could not find examples of in fiction, in, in and most of the female presidents we've seen have been sitcoms. Uh, there was Hail to the Chief with Patty Duke back in the day. Uh, obviously, we have Veep now. Uh, most of the books have been science fiction, and it's some <laughs> other world, you know, Copel or you know, whatever. So not real presidents. You, you haven't had a lot of American ones, and you really haven't had a lot in any form who ran for office in one. Mm -hmm. And if you can't. I do think you kind of need to, when you watch the West Wing, we see the campaign. We see the primaries. We see the, you know, we see all the steps. And if that had been done with a woman, you know, say that was played by Stockard Channing, mm -hmm. and he was <laughs> the hardworking um, partner, it would have been, that would have been groundbreaking for television mm -hmm. to watch that. Mm -hmm. And we just, we haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. And I think in America, there's a little bit of a tendency, if you've seen it, i.e. Donald Trump, maybe you want to vote for it. And if you haven't seen it and you can't imagine it, it becomes a little bit more of an imaginary story. Mm -hmm. Marianne, how did you decide? Did you, did, had, were you familiar with any of these representations? Was that what got you interested in politics in the first place? Did you want to be a politician yourself? How did you get into political consulting and punditry? I've always loved politics. I mean, for as long as I can remember, and I don't know how I know that, but I, I always did. Um, decided not to go to law school, probably the best decision I ever made, um, despite applying multiple times and getting in and deferring and all that. I just, I loved campaigns. I still do. Um, and that's what I love the most, is you know working on them and helping elect people and all that. Um, the, the punditry piece was total happenstance, um, more than anything. Like, that was not part of the plan. Um, way back at one point, I think like so many people, you think you're going to run yourself someday and I'm just going to learn how to do these campaigns so I'll know how to do mine. And plenty of people do that. But I came to the decision that I thought I could, I would be, I would do a better job helping a lot of people get elected and that would be my contribution. And there's nothing better than honestly working on a campaign and winning. Nothing better. And there's nothing worse than losing. <laughs> um, 
And the analysis piece is just, it's been, um, it, that was just serendipity. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, not to, I do think uh, people who do analysis who are good are the people who've done campaigns. There are a lot mm. of people on TV now and elsewhere who are reporters or uh, columnists or opinion writers, what have you, um, that have never worked on a campaign. They cover them, they think they know them, but unless you work in them, you don't. Mm. And I've been very fortunate, I think I'm, I, my batting average is pretty good because I know what it takes to work on a campaign, I know what it takes to win. You know the different cycles of a campaign and what has to happen to be successful or not. So for me, having that knowledge um, makes me a far more accurate an analyst on TV or what have you than a lot of, a lot of people give their opinions. Um, and I'm on with people who give a lot of opinions. But when it comes to the actual campaign, and especially in a presidential year, unless you've done campaigns and you know, and not just a pre unless you've done any campaigns and a presidential campaign, because they're, you know, they're all hard and kind of a different beast, um, you understand them and you know what the next stage is and what's coming and what needs to be done and all that. Even in a crazy year like this where you're watching, we're all watching a race unfold that has never been seen before by anybody <laughs> in modern history and may never be seen again and it's only going to get even more epically crazy um, over the next year given how everybody feels about it. And we're, you know, we were talking about this before. I mean, when you have 24 million people, 23 million people, 13.5 million people watching debates in a primary with a year to go. That tells you a lot that, of how people feel about uh, this election, how people feel about the country, how the people feel about Washington, how they feel about Wall Street. And yes, Donald Trump's a big part of that and drawing people to it, but it's a lot more than that. Um, because even the Democratic for first debate, um, there were more people who watched that than watched the very last debate between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama in April of 2008. Wow. And at that point, no one really knew which one of them was going to get the nomination. It was pretty close. More people have watched these debates than watched that one. Wow. So that tells you a lot right there. And, and so even though con I, said, I can remember saying this the crack of dawn yesterday morning on a radio interview, even though conventional wisdom's out the window and everything about this election is antithetical to everything else you've ever seen, and you have to view it that way, still knowing what campaigns do and work makes a big difference. Yeah. And is the punditry world also uneven in terms of gender? Like, oh, are there God, yeah. way more men than women? Well, I mean, that's true of everything, right? So, so <laughs> <laughs> there are more male reporters, right, than, than women. There are more male bylines than women. There are more on-air male talent, talent, uh, than women, or host shows, or our analysts, or on the Sunday shows. So you're what you, we view politics and, and campaigns through the largely through the eyes of men, not exclusively, but mostly. There are more women now than there used to be, but we're nowhere close um, to what it should be. And that everyone brings to it a perspective and a viewpoint. And you know, I, I know a lot of reporters, and I have great relationships with all of them, and enjoy all. But everyone brings the, everyone brings their perspective to it. And I think um, that's certainly one of the interesting things watching um, the media cover women candidates versus male candidates, and including the Senate races here when Coakley was up against Brown, Warren was up against Brown, and a lot of what went on there, um, and even what we're watching now. So, so you know, journalists are, I think we all try to be objective. I, as a Democrat on Fox, yes, I, cr I am critical of Democrats when they make mistakes or they make a dumb decision or whatever. I will say that. Um, but I think um, it's hard to provide a prism um, into politics and into what you see without bringing your own personal views to it, no matter how objective you try to be. And if you accept that premise, then you know, it, there are different biases and skewing going on to watching what's going on if you only consume mm. media. And I, and I, one last point, and this drove me crazy <laughs> recently. Um, Bernie Sanders had a rally here, right, in Boston, and everyone reported that there were 16,000 people there, 20,000 people there, one person said 24,000 people. So I actually go to these things, right? Um, so I went over to the, the seaport 
and I went to Genin. I went into the seaport, and there are three. They have they have uh, three ball, four ballrooms there, um, and each one holds four thousand people. They only had one open. The others were closed. So if you were indoors, that was four thousand people there. Then they opened up um, an area called, by the lawn on D. That too held four thousand people. How do I know that? I asked the Boston police officers who were there with the clickers, right? And I asked the security people who worked the building because that's how you find out how many people are at these things. So there were actually 8,000 people there. Not 16, not 20, not 24, eight. And yet everybody reported 16,000 or 20,000. And so I contacted two reporters who I knew were there and I said, where'd you get this number? And they said, well, we got it from the campaign. <laughs> I said, well, didn't you not ask the police? Did you not ask the security? No, no, no. We, we just took the number we were given. And that, if you go back and look, after we finish this, every media outlet in the country used that number. Every single one. So you, you, there's, there's a, and I'm not beating up on the media per se, but there's, you have to, obviously we all use it. Obviously I'm a small part of it. But if you want to really understand what's going out, on in politics, go find out yourself. And one of the great things about being in Massachusetts is go to New Hampshire. There is nothing better than the New Hampshire primary. It is the greatest thing in politics. And it's not even an hour away. And people there take it very seriously and they pick presidents. So if you really wanna know what's going on, I mean, great story, quick story. Uh, I do a Sunday show for Channel 5. We had Nikki Songus this morning as our guest, Congresswoman from Massachusetts. And her, hus her late husband, Paul Songus, ran for president. Oh, yeah. She told a story this morning on the air and said that she had a Paul Songus for president button on as she's going through the tolls in New Hampshire because they were going to another place. This is when he was running against Clinton. They stopped, gave the money, this is before Easy Pass, to the person taking the tolls. And the person taking the tolls, and she goes, oh, do you know Paul Songus? And she said, yes, as a matter of fact. He's my husband. She goes, that's great. I have his book. I'm going to read his book before I go see him on Tuesday and before I vote next week. That's what everybody in New Hampshire does. And that's great. So go find out for yourself. Like, don't believe me or other people. Go find out for yourself what's going on in the world, and especially in politics. Yeah, and it's really exciting. Yeah, like really. you were saying about campaign work, it's really, it's got a lot of inherent drama built in that you can capitalize on as a writer too, right? Yeah. 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 So what do you think, Ellen, about like I'm thinking about Catherine von Powers as a as a as a character and Hillary Clinton as our actual candidate. Do you have any thoughts about about similarities and differences? They're very, very different. They're so different. Yeah. It, it, I live in New York and I know a bunch of people who know Hillary. I do not know Hillary, although I've heard her in person a number of times. And they all talk about what she's actually like. And it, it just doesn't translate a lot of the time. Mm. She never, to me, feels comfortable in her skin. She's actually had a pretty good three weeks, in my opinion. But like right now, yeah. she's finally getting on her game. But Hillary has always been just a little uncomfortable. I think it was because when she was born, kind of right when everything began to change, and she sort of caught between generate. I mean, if she'd been born, 10 years later, 20 years later, I don't think she ever marries Bill, but. Uh, <laughs> now but, we're entering the realm um, of speculative fiction but, about you Hillary. know, I think it's just a different thing. Hillary just, I think the Clintons are so unique to anyone else in the world you can possibly, because the president I've heard about is pretty traditional political path, mm -hmm. nothing too unusual. And, you know, I like to think she's funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's, you know, she seems more accessible to me mm -hmm. than, and, you know, Hillary has just always been, for this particular time in our history, with so much noise, like, I'm finding a treat at this moment. I don't exactly know where my phone is. I'm glad. I'm not looking at anything. I'm not, you know, turning the phone off is sometimes the best thing that just ever happened to you. But right now, watching the Obama presidency, been a lot of noise. <laughs> a lot of noise of all kinds, all day, every day. Everyone has an opinion. And just, I don't think he's as good at shutting him out, shutting it out. Hillary has been getting this garbage for 
30 years or however long it's been. I actually think she would be a very good president for these times because I think she would be capable of just going to the Oval Office, shutting the door, and getting her work done, leaving the rest of us alone, <laughs> which is kind of what I'm looking for for a president right now. <laughs> you know, just, we want jobs. We want, <laughs> we want not to be fighting wars. There, there are things we want, and we'd like a little bit of peace, just not this, um, really, the last 15 years of the, the, these two presidencies, there's been, it was never polarized like this. You know, in the old days, Chip O'Neill and, Ron Reagan sitting together, having drinks together. So it, it didn't used to be that if you had a different opinion, you were a bad person. Is and we've gotten to this weird place where if I disagree with you, I think you're evil. You know, it, it's like, wow, what's up with that? The whole point of democracy is lively conversation leading to consensus and compromise, and that's how things work. And we're in this awful... I don't know how we're going to get. You would need an incredibly charming and charismatic and relaxed, easygoing president to get back to that. And I think, What's, I think we're a ways away from that. To so what right now, we need media, someone who can shut out the do, noise. Do we think complicit in in the in the state of affairs or or a cause a causal factor? I mean, I think social media has accelerated everything. If you go yeah. back to first cable. Right, uh, it, which was the 24-7. We used to have news cycles. Now it's a never-ending hose that runs. Uh, and then you throw in Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and everything else. It's never-ending, never-ending, never And it happens all the time. And news breaks you know, on your phone, especially in politics, on Twitter um, all the time, 24-7. And so I think that has accelerated everything. And it's also amped everything up because everybody has a voice. Everyone always had a voice, but you only had certain places that you could use your voice. You mm -hmm. could vote, you know, you could write a letter to the editor, quaint notion, you know, you could do a few other things. But, you know, I have, I do Fox News every Monday morning. And before I'm off the air, my Twitter feed blows up. Usually not good, <laughs> but, and people will find an email for me at work or whatever. And I find, and a lot of times they're really brutal, frankly. Um, and oftentimes I reply to them. And I find that the people I reply to, I don't reply to everybody, um, they're always shocked to hear from me <laughs> um, because I think they think they're anonymous, that there's no consequence to what they say or do. They think they can just put it out there on Twitter or say something about you and nothing's gonna be done about it. And I always reply, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for taking the time to write. If there's profanity involved, I ask them to write me back without it. Um, and let's have, a, you know, let's have a conversation, a debate, or whatever. Um, and that usually works. So I, I think that's a large part of it. And I think candidates in particular, if you've been around for a while, um, are used to things being very different and not used to having an iPhone on you all the time, trackers on you all the time. Um, as I said, you know, Google Maps showing where your hairdresser, you know, in Chappaqua, you know, where her salon is. I mean, all those things. I think it amps everything up, and it's sort of like politics on steroids. And I think it's that's always a it's always a hard beast to manage, and your job is to try to manage it, always as a candidate, as a campaign. But it just it's so big now, and it's so fast. And I think that has also, to your point. Harden people's opinions. Mm. So if you if you have a set of opinions, you're you're just not open to hearing anybody else's ideas. You know, if if you're a conservative Republican um, who just believes that Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders are the Antichrist, you can't be persuaded otherwise. And 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 I would say the same of of people on the left too. Mm -hmm. So it's made that kind of, the ability to have a conversation difficult, let alone work out deals and compromises when a lot of people on the left and right don't believe you should have them. Mm -hmm. and, and then just one thing to your point, if, if you go back to the Hillary Clinton of the late 80s, early 90s, like when, her, when Bill Clinton was running uh, for re-election as governor or when he was running for president the first time, that Hillary Clinton in this environment would walk away with this race. Oh, yeah. Would walk away with it. She was much more authentic. Uh, sharp, on the ball, willing to say anything, challenge anybody. I mean, just go back and look at her, like during the 92 election, for example, and the statement she made, or being a surrogate for her husband who was running for re-election in Arkansas. That person, there would be no contest right now. 
I think what has happened over the years is when you are subjected to a beating <laughs> by the media and others all these years, you start to get a little carapace. Yeah, and, and, like and defensive. And, yeah. And, but I think she's starting to hit her stride because now she's out there doing more. Um, and I think you know, that's also the Jeb Bush problem is Jeb Bush is just not performing um, well as a candidate. And you can have the best ads and the best campaigns, but if your candidate's not performing, um, on the stump and when they meet people, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, the, the super PAC for Jeb Bush has spent over $16 million just around here lately on ads, and his poll numbers have dropped, not gone up. You used to be able to buy five points, right, with a TV ad or two, right? You'd put some money in New Hampshire, put them in Boston. That was like a good five points. You could maybe get 10. Now, because the ads show Jeb Bush one way, and yet everybody who meets Jeb Bush in New Hampshire 15 times because they pride themselves on that, that's not the person they see. Yeah. So that, the, the real person, the reality, versus the, the, the perception of that that's put on TV um, aren't the same. And so when you have a candidate who just does not perform and does not connect with people, you're not going to win that race because who's going to vote for somebody they don't like? If you don't like somebody, you're never going to get to trust them, right? You're never going to get through those four steps. And I think that's what you see right now. And if you would use that measure, you can size up pretty much where everybody is in this race. Hmm. Really interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I think it's, I wish, I'm a big Elizabeth Warren fan. I really like her. Yeah. And one thing, I think she's someone, I wish she were running, but I don't have a problem with Hillary. I will be, I'll be supporting Hillary. But a thing that, a, is very appealing about someone like Elizabeth Warren for these times is when she says something, no matter what it is, I believe her. Yep. I believe she is saying what she thinks. I may not agree with it, in her case, I usually do, but there's a real appeal. People just, you know, we're all, there's probably no one in this room who isn't old enough to vote. Maybe a couple of you are prodigies and got in when you were 15 and maybe you can't vote yet. But, Probably you, you can all vote. So we're all grown-ups. Don't you just want someone to tell you the truth? Like, don't you want someone to say, wow, we got into Afghanistan, this is a big old mess, and I don't know how we're going to get out. And we're going to, you know, just tell you, the, tell you the truth, saying, OK, we passed this health care. We did our best. Some of it doesn't work. We need to go. We do not need to get rid of it. We just need to change a few things. We need to have less narrow networks. We need to do this. But let's all work to get, like Elizabeth Warren talks, and I just think she spent years studying this. She spent countless hours probably lying on the couch in their house, staring at the ceiling, thinking about it. And now when she speaks it, I totally believe her. I, I don't think she's jerking us around. And it's. <laughs> We were talking about Trump, because I happen to know a bunch of people. I played softball for years in Central Park. We, went, we won the city championship one year, like six years ago. We were very impressive. And my name is spelled wrong on the trophy. I'm not bitter. But um, mm. almost all the people work for Trump. And they're all like Democrats and, and mostly Latino. And so they love the man. And, you know, I've heard so many good things about him. You're kind of thinking, OK, I must adjust my mind to see that he's probably a kind man. But I think part of the appeal to a guy like him is you think he's telling you what he thinks, whether you agree with it, whether you think it's stupid, <laughs> no matter what it is. You're, and in fact, I think he hurt himself a little inside baseball here, perhaps, I thought he hurt himself a little in the last debate because it's starting to become clear that he now has handlers. Hmm. And he's now, he is starting to sound more like a politician. And that's why I think he's hit his peak and is going to start moving down. But Marianne um, but disagrees. Yeah, yeah, we disagree on that. We were having a lively conversation about that yeah, before. I, I'll talk but, about Warren but, and then Trump. I mean, Warren, I thought her best moment was that unauthorized video in the home of, I think it was Joyce Linehan, where she said that you didn't build this on your own. If you know, yeah. we all paid for the roads, yeah. we all paid for this. If you have a business, yeah. we contributed to your, the, your workers' education, everything. And even she, during the campaign, was managed, right? So she yeah. dialed it back a little bit and didn't look comfortable at points, especially in some of the debates where she was coached to do or not do certain things with Scott Brown. 
But once she got into office, she went back to being the Elizabeth Warren, you know, that I think we all know. Yeah. And that the, the most effective politicians are the people who talk like they don't care. They don't care if they're going to, they don't care. They're just going to tell you what they think. And that's the most refreshing thing to me because the more you do that, the more people like you. And most politicians and people who work for them counsel the opposite. You can't say this, you can't do that because you voters aren't going to like it. Anyone. Right. Yeah. And voters are smarter than that. They know, they know that Elizabeth Warren, when she talks, she, she really believes what she says. And that's what people like about Donald Trump. The, he's saying, whether you agree with him or not, offensive or not, um, a lot of people believe and like Build a and wall, think what, he, a really big what wall. he says. It will work. And that's, that's why he's so appealing to mm -hmm. so many people right now. Mm -hmm. And I think Hillary's best possible move would be, this is probably the last time she's going to run, because how old is she, 68 She or won't run again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. she wins, she'll run for re-election. Yeah, but, but she, won't, no. she won't run again if right. she does not win. Just go for it. Say what you think. It, like, it, they're so afraid to lose and to be taken out of context and to do that. Just If she just relaxed and went for it, but we've I think just she'd... been saying, right, it's so hard when there's stuff on you all the time and any little tiny thing you do, it can be blown way out. I mean, I think this is a real paradox, Well, that's why I right? think it's a strength for her that she's been getting garbage from the very beginning. I don't actually, th I don't think it hurts her feelings. I don't think she actually, gets, she's like, fine, whatever. And if she can, you know, the more she can say what she actually thinks, what she's actually planning to do, and I do think she's hitting her stride a little because. If you look at, it, I, I think the great example is the Benghazi hearings, right? <laughs> the 11 hours Benghazi hearings where there couldn't have been a bigger disconnect between Hillary Clinton and what she said and the people on that panel because every single one of the Republicans on that panel absolutely positively believe everything they said and more about her and the Democrats believe the exact opposite of what they believe, of the, their Republican counterparts, and, and she believed otherwise, and, and, and that helped her more than anything. But I assure you that all the Republicans on that panel will do very well in their reelections in their home districts, because that's what the people that they represent believe. And I think that's a perfect microcosm of the politics that we have right now. Um, and even though I think that was politically advantageous to her, and you could see it in the polling afterwards by the way she handled it. I mean, they kept baiting her every, for, I mean, everyone who questioned her, even little things that I think maybe some people didn't notice, like a number of the Republicans kept saying, well, why don't you read your notes from your staff? Now, let me give you a moment so you can take a look at that note your staff just wrote to you or prepared for you before you answer that question. I mean, that was, they, they had a number of stock lines like that in an effort to diminish her, demean her, or try to get her to snap. And if she had ever shown any anger during those 11 hours like she did the first time, I assure you her poll numbers would have dropped precipitously. So th th if a guy did it, it would have been passionate and a defense and lots of other ways to define it. Had she done it, it would have been a debacle. Hey. Oh man, I think that is a moment to open things up <laughs> for questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please just trot right down to one of the microphones. And if you have to leave, students who have other things to do, please feel free to leave and don't feel uncomfortable. Um, so what, qu what questions do you all have for our panelists? Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'll start. People are shy about questions, but think about your question. This is very rich conversation. So much I want to ask. Let me make one quick comment and then ask a question. The comment is that I think one of the things that you implied, Mara, when you talked about these wonderful uh, uh, novels about a woman president yeah. is, the, is, is something really important. It's almost always the case that popular culture precedes actuality. Right. Uh, many people have said that Obama owes his election in some degree to the n number of black figures of authority that began to appear in popular culture. Black football coaches like Tony Dungy, uh, black presidents on television programs, things of that kind. And of course, uh, something similar is, is also uh, the case with, the, with, with, with feminism and with the perspective we have on, on female candidates. And I'm sure that your novels are among 
the, the, the most important items that are helping to uh, reach a, an audience that pays no attention to normal political discourse. And that, I think that's really valuable. My question is this. What I discern here is a, a, a Hillary bias, to put it mildly. <laughs> How about all her negatives, folks? Even those of us who are eager for a female president are, are, at least some of us, are incredibly unhappy that she has to be the vessel of this, of this uh, revolutionary event. And I, it seems to me uh, 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 important for the panel to acknowledge in how many ways she is a compromised and in some ways a, a less than stellar candidate. And what a, what, how tragic that is in an environment in which the Republicans seem intent on nominating an intolerable clown. Uh, anyway, well, not, it doesn't sound like a question, I guess, what it really is. T hmm. Talk about Hillary's, about we, what's problematic about Hillary and your own reactions and what you think more broadly. We play the cards we have. Hillary is our card right now. I'm a big Elizabeth Warren fan, and the person I'm watching very closely, although I hope it doesn't take quite that long, is uh, Gillibrand. I think Gillibrand would be a fabulous president. Um, well, all the Hillary people leave him, see, <laughs> uh, You know, if I were making up a candidate to be our first female president, would it be Hillary? No, not even close. There are a lot of downsides. She's our best shot right now. She's, our, she's a viable shot. I would rather... When I said earlier, people said, oh, I vote for a woman, just not that woman. You're going to find flaws with it. Not you, the world, me, everybody. We're all going to find flaws with every single female candidate who shows up. And frankly, I don't always agree with myself. So I certainly <laughs> don't always agree with everybody else. Um, yeah, I can change my mind in the middle of an argument. Hillary has a lot of downsides. There, so you inspire trust. Um, well, because I'm very, I always tell the truth. <laughs> you know, it's hard to trust them. Don't believe Yeah, but if you go back to the Clintons, the Clintons just, they do their Clinton thing. They make us all crazy. I think deep down, their little hearts are in the right place. As long as you give them enough trinkets, <laughs> then, I, you know, the Clinton. The Bill Clinton years were pretty awesome. Peace and prosperity, I have to tell you, they were great. They were fun. We haven't had that for 15 years. Um, really, Hillary is what we have. We could do better, but how long must we wait? We should have had a female president 30 years ago. We, have, we should have had a female president 50 years ago. We should always have had 50-50. You know, we haven't. And if that is who we can get in, and I think, I think she'll do a pretty good job. You know, there will be times if she wins that she will drive me absolutely up a tree, and I will be spouting on social media about her, probably. But she's smart. She will work hard. And if you've ever, I've heard her speak a number of times in person, and she's that rare bird who speaks extemporaneously in full pages, not sentences not paragraphs, full pages on any issue under the sun. You're thinking, wow, if you were a guy, she certainly wouldn't have won in 2008 without even, mm. I mean, she would have. And Is that your sense too, Marianne? I think, I think Senator Obama would have been the vice president, and then he would be running right now in a more experienced place and probably be a better president than he has been, um, I think. Could be wrong. I would Over just, to you. I would just say to you, um, the topic is women in politics tonight, so there you go. Um, and I would challenge you about Bernie Sanders. I would challenge you about Barack Obama. Well, I, no, he's the shouting. No, what was he saying? What was he yelling at someone for shouting? It's all he does. Anyway. Right. <laughs> well, he's, right. the man's from Brooklyn. Right. Come on, give him. That's what she should give have said. Was she going to get away with? Okay, that's the reality of it. Barack well, Obama. Just, look, I mean, no, no, I, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just address. What you said, I appreciate your question and provocative, but I think it. When I listen to you ask that question, I'm hard pressed to think you would say that about a guy. P 
Period. But I'm hard pressed to put to, to, to make a negative argument no, about a woman that, that about, about a candidate because there's no perfect candidate. Period. No, but, well, because you know, people are flawed. I don't think. And so flawed. Barack Obama had shortcomings. Bernie Sanders has shortcomings. Um, John Kerry, who I worked for for years, had shortcomings. I mean, let me go down the list. All of them. I mean, you know, they, they swift voted him. Okay. I mean, let me go down the list. So I think you know. So I I just want to. I Actually, put that to you I, and I, say, I could give you a different you example know. if you follow New York politics at all. Sure. I'm a New Yorker. In our last mayoral race, Christine Quinn right. was running. She was a stellar candidate. She was perfect for the job. She had all the right experience, all the right everything. And you know what everybody said? I'd vote for a woman. Just not, Just not that woman. Right. And you're thinking, what do you want? If we were drawing her up in a lab, we would have created Christine Quinn to be the first female mayor of New York City. Right. You know, I, and I hear this argument. It didn't, and, you know, I got it. it's... Right. Look, she did the profile and glamour. She did everything she was supposed to look, do. It still didn't work. <laughs> look, in a way, you're both, you've misunderstood my question. It's not, I don't want to be critical of Hillary directly, I mean, although I can be. I think yeah. she is. Yeah. What I meant by the fact that she's a compromised candidate are the obvious things. First of all, she's a Clinton. How many times do we have to have dynasties in the country? Even if she was perfect in other ways, that would be a tremendous negative for many people. Second, something you people aren't acknowledging. Most of the people I know who really hate kill Hillary are feminists. And, the reason, other and they hate her. I was going to say. Just I mean, a minute. Is that a surprise? No, come on. My my son is my son, who is who, my son is a very extreme feminist. He can, he believes that Andrea Dworkin is the the most sensible writer about politics who ever lived, and he represents <laughs> he represents sorry, a radical he represents a radical extreme of feminism. They hate kill Hillary because she was an apologist. What they say she was an apologist for a rapist. They hate Bill Clinton because he was, a rape, he was a rapist. They feel that almost under no circumstances do they want to vote for him. Now, I know they're a minority, but they're on the left. Then there are all these people on the right who hate Hillary and hate the Clintons for all kinds of terrible reasons. Right? That's all I meant by the fact that she was a compromised candidate. Look, I, I will vote for her, however many. Uh, I'd vote for almost any, I'd vote for virtually any Democrat in this environment anyway. And I certainly would prefer to vote for a woman than for a man for any office, for the reasons you people have made clear and that any rational person accepts. What I'm saying is, it seems to me a tragic, dangerous situation in which, in an election in which almost any not a, 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 a candidate, I would say, is less compromised, would have a much easier time winning. Because, but and that's what I'm we saying. Don't have Why can't we recognize that we're faced with a terrible problem here because there are so many people in the country who begin already knowing they will never vote for this person? Because so, everyone is flawed. And when you run for president, you have a choice between usually two, sometimes three people, right. all right? So all I would say is, I've heard this for years. Everyone can always tell me how flawed a woman is, and I can tell you for a fact, women are other women's worst enemies. Fact, yeah. and every woman here yeah. knows this, unless you're like 18, maybe you or something, but yeah, <laughs> that's just what happens, okay? Um, and that's why, we hold women to a much higher standard, yeah. women do, and men, right? And I could go down chapter and verse, but I'm not going to, about all the flaws of, we've elected every version of a man as president of the United States, okay? We're about to be on 45. They've been tall, short, fat, skinny, white, black, Catholic, Episcopalian, born again Christian, recovered and alcoholic. Let me go down the list. Okay, we've, we've elected almost every version of a man, almost. Not every single kind, but pretty close. And we've never, ever, ever elected a woman. Now, if you wanted a better, other woman should have run. I agree, Chris, Kirsten Gillibrand, phenomenal. Yeah. But she's but not she has, running. She has young okay? children. She will run in about eight or 12 years. There are lots of you women know, out there who yeah. lose to substandard men, who lose races on that. So is there a perfect woman candidate? No. And Hillary Clinton is human like everybody else, so she's just like every other candidate. Too generous to her leadership. You know what? I, here, here, I'm going to leave you on this point so we can listen to somebody else. I would ask you to watch this video when it comes up online and watch how you asked that question, talked about it, and your perception of her, and then show me one male candidate you would say the same about. 
at, at any level. That is as compromised as that? Yeah, Senate, I would say that, Congress, I would say that about Bill Clinton. Tom, I, wouldn't, Congress, I wouldn't vote for Bill Clinton if he ran for dog catcher. I think he's an immoral rapist. I would never vote for I him. think that it's Rachel's turn to yeah. ask a question. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you guys for coming and speaking. I was wondering why do you think it is that a lot of, I feel like a lot of different countries, and you mentioned Canada as an example, have been progressive in the sense that there's a lot of women presidents and women chancellors and heads of state. Why do you think it is particular in America's case when like women and women's rights have been an issue across the world? Why is it that in America's case it, you feel it's so far behind in that sense? Thanks. Great question. It's, yeah. it's a great question. It, it's staggering, I think. Part of it is, it is still okay to trash women yeah. in America. I wish it weren't. Um, women get hammered. Women in the public eye, no matter who the, uh, let's take it out of politics for a second. Jennifer Lawrence brought millions of people into movies. Millions and millions of people. She has, what, two Academy Awards, three yeah, nominations? Two. But three nominations, because yeah. I don't think she got it for Winter's right. Bone. <laughs> She got paid considerably less than Jeremy Renner, who was a walkthrough in a movie. For, you know, forget Bradley Cooper and the others. She got paid less than the supporting characters. Right. Um, I think in America, we're in this time of change where, for example, with the passage of gay marriage, there are certain things that we are moving forward, and obviously things with race are moving forward. and gender identity and sexual identity and things like that, that people are starting to talk about and be less comfortable about, it's still okay to trash women. Right. It, it's still okay to say, huh, it's an okay outfit, but she looks kind of fat, right. doesn't she? Right. Um, and, you know, I think, because when you look at some of the countries that have elected women, some of them are, at least one is, to my knowledge, Liberia is a Muslim country, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. at least one is a Muslim country, which you would not think would be a good. Okay, yeah. So America, I like to think, I'm a little bit of a fan of exceptionalism, even though it's not proper in global times. Um, but I like to think America should be a model for a world, and we aren't. And I'm embarrassed by it. And I'd like to see us do better. And I, do I have any idea why we don't? No, but. She is very right that no one is harder on women than other women. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think I mean, if, if the, we're the majority of the population, if we really want to put a woman in office, we can do it. How, how you treat women is how women get treated, right? So to your point about what it, it's okay to trash women, you, people say things about women that if you said it about someone who is gay or African American or anything else would be a hate crime, okay? But it happens every single day. We don't pay women as much as men in the same jobs. Still, that is a fact. And why is Jennifer Lawrence gonna get more money now? Because Bradley Cooper said he's not gonna do a movie with her unless she does, okay? I mean, mm. women's health care gets decided by men, not by women. Let, let's go, the basic fundamental things that women deal with every day are decided by people other than women, even though women are the majority. So I think, whether it's questions that are asked, points that are made, or all that, you need to put yourself in that situation. And by the way, on this earth, for the most part, you're either a man or a woman. You can be an African American woman, you can be a Latino woman, you can be lots of forms of women, you can be lots of forms of men. But somehow, women always come up at the short end of the stick, always, even though women are the majority in this country. And I think until women are paid as much, are represented in Congress, in political office, and on SCEOs, and on boards, that's not going to change. But in, ter in terms of thinking through like the comparative question though, right, which is like why is America doing so much worse than other countries, I wonder, Right. Norway. I wonder if yeah. we could think about the history of the feminist movement in this country and what happened with the feminist movement in this country and versus those other places. You know, this might be a way to start thinking. But that doesn't have a very strong feminist Yeah, culture. that's true. Yeah, I don't know. It's a mystery. If audience members have ideas, they should. They should the the, in. the next book I wrote, this jumps slightly, but it is a similar issue, is about a young woman who actually is good enough to play professional baseball. Boy, does she get a lot of garbage. Wow. 
people are not, and she is good enough. She's a 6'2 lefty, and <laughs> that's what you're going to need, and a pitcher. But, you know, in this last year, the NCAA softball finals and the women's soccer great victories got higher ratings than the NBA finals, right. the Stanley Cup, and I forget what else. Not football, because, you know, <laughs> Americans, I watch football too. I have my Patriots hat right behind me. But, you know, you see women making these little steps, but so far behind everywhere. Right. Sports, <laughs> Hollywood. Uh, a friend of mine who is a novelist did a wonderful book called Hilled, if you want an intellectual version of Game of Thrones, did a study recently about the percentage of women winning the major literary awards. Minuscule. I, I just minuscule. Even the number of female main characters, because most of the women who are winning the awards have male main characters. Or women directors. There's a big thing yeah, about women directors. Yeah, women directors. Now, women, right? Right. And, you know, I personally think even if we picked a f person as our female president who not everyone's going to love, God, it changes everything. It's just, there's a trickle down into all fields. I don't care who it is. I, I truly don't. I really just want a woman in the Oval Office, in charge. I think and one, one point, OK, as a country founded fleeing re religious persecution, uh, a lot of religions don't have women in, as priests or bishops. Or I mean, I think you, if you look at some of the more main religions that this country, uh, whether I mean, the Protestant church, Episcopalian church is better about it now. But a lot of this country is Roman Catholic, and women just do not participate in any level of Catholicism in any leadership role. Mm -hmm. So I think that had a lot to do with it. And a lot of politics, um, there were a lot of Irish Americans and Italian Americans, obviously largely Catholic um, politicians, who ran and made politics their vocation because they were shut out of other jobs back in the day. Irish need not apply, go through all of that. So th there's a lot, there's a real intersection between religion and opportunities and how women are used, are, are allowed to participate in religion. And I think that had a lot to do with the way mm -hmm. politics unfolded in this country. I also think that a reason why a lot of times women get more grief than men is, is, is that at some level, if you can't persuade the next generation to, to think of themselves as feminists, if that's a tough sell, right? That's a big problem, right? I mean, like now we'll, we're willing to say like that's racism, that's homophobia, right? right? But that sexism is is a harder thing to get people on board with sometimes. I think there's been a, a very effective campaign, especially by the right, to demonize that word, and a lot of young women don't want to be associated with that word exactly. because of the semantical demonization of the word. Right. And I also think that a lot of young women don't understand that even women who walk out of here in a few years will get paid less than the guy you're in next to in the lab or sitting next to today. And that won't change. That has not changed. And it won't change for some time. And I think young women are idealistic like we all were. And as I said, you know, 30 years later, I did not think we would have made so little po progress in politics. Yeah. Shocking, stunning, and unacceptable. So I think that's where um, young women in particular need to be vigilant about the hard-won battles that have been uh, waged, fought, and won, and they haven't been enough, um, to make sure that those things don't go back. I mean, what good is it if you have reproductive rights, but there isn't a clinic in your state to go to? What good is it? And that's what's going on in this country, systematically. So I think whether it's voting rights, reproductive rights, it, pay, we're talking, I mean, pay equality is a major battle in this country, that women should get paid as much as men. And the only women who are guaranteed to be paid the same as men are elected office. Hmm. That's it. Hmm. Nothing else. You know, my thing is, we still haven't come up with a good answer to your question. Why? Do, because Maybe nobody, you know, why have other countries done it? I have no idea. We have to keep thinking. Um, but I, think I mean, it's, it's a puzzle. So I hope we didn't disappoint you by that, because <laughs> America should do better. We just should. So we have a question over here. Uh, maybe it's already brought up a little bit, but I was wondering, I'm here as a visitor. I'm here as an observer. I'm not, I cannot vote in that country. Um, I'm coming from a very small and unimportant country, but our Although social. Although important. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so I still but what I, what I think for me it's impressive and I'm following the debates is how much religious topics come up. And you always know the religious affiliation of the candidates. In my country, you never know that. Um, and I, for me, this is just something that I was wondering about. And also my question connects to that. What does religion do with the question of gender and politics have? You already started to talk about yeah. that. But I would like to hear a little bit more and also yeah, it, you hear it most often from male um, politicians and less from female politicians that they write books in uh, religious fields and or have an active role in churches. I mean, it's also because um, in Catholic Church there is a hierarchy and the women are excluded, of right. course. But uh, in my country, we have more Catholics than in ever um, other denomination. And we have in the executive uh, committee, there are in the presidential committee, so we don't have a president like the United States, but there are more women than men. So this connection we don't, I cannot make in my country. Why do you think there are more women than men? Because they got voted in. Yeah, but there are, why, why do you think, I, I'm just curious. It's, it's like a what question. Made, what made your country say, we're voting for the best candidate? Yeah, we don't, because we don't they, care. They were qualified to do that job. What a concept. Yeah. <laughs> if only that was all it took. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from? Switzerland. OK. There you go. Um, I, I, I'd go back to, I mean, religion has always played a, uh, a role in politics. And it's obviously one of the big reasons why we have the United States of America. Um, I think a seminal moment in religion and politics was when Jack Kennedy was elected president of the United States. He was the first Catholic to ever win the presidency. Um, Al Smith and others had tried and failed. So it was such a big issue that he actually had to give a speech about it. And it was the biggest speech he gave during the presidential campaign in 1960. And it was because so many people were suspicious of Catholics and thought that President Kennedy, if he became president, would take his orders from the Vatican and the Pope. Okay, fast forward um, between 1960 and 2008. Two things happened. One, we started to have family value voters. And from Reagan forward, Ralph Reed, the Christian coalition, born again Christians, evangelical Christians became major factors in politics. Um, it was also part of an agenda on social issues. So social issues became a very conservative wedge issue, especially around issues like abortion. Um, that became major, major issues in every presidential campaign and US Senate races in particular as well, to try to elect Republicans, not Democrats. Um, and to th then that evolved to gay rights, and that was used as a wedge issue in the presidential campaign in 2004. Go to 2008 and Barack Obama. Barack Obama belonged to a church with a guy named Reverend Wright. Mm. Jeremiah Wright, very controversial. They pulled a lot of his uh, speeches and, and, uh, and sermons that he gave, and Barack Obama was forced to give a speech in Philadelphia about his religion about Jeremiah Wright and about the things he said and his beliefs. Um, and that was probably as important in a speech as any that Barack Obama gave uh, during that presidential campaign. And had he not hit it out of the park on substance and style, you could argue he might not have been the nominee. Um, so people have used religion in the United States in politics, not as much for good as for getting elected. Um, and I think oftentimes what you find is Many of the people who use religion as part of their platform and a cudgel of sorts oftentimes don't live up to it. Um, and that's when you, people are practicing the politics of hypocrisy. But make no mistake about it, many political, the political use of religion has certainly more than anything been used to keep women behind. And women are the ones who've paid the price for that more than anything, not only by not getting elected, but by having um, legislation and bills passed that hurt them. And I, again, on social issues in particular. So that's the sad truth about all of this. Um, what you would like to believe going forward is now that we've made progress, and still not enough, on um, civil rights, which we still need to do much better on, on gay rights, which we still need to do much better on, I think people have lost sight of women's rights. And when you, I will leave you on this note. In this country, the fact is, not only are women the majority, the vast, major the vast majority of women in this country support themselves or their family alone because they're either divorced, single parents, or they outlive their spouse or partner. So at some point in this country, 
every woman supports themselves and somebody else. And so they rely on their paycheck, period. Women make at least $250,000 less per person in their lifetime because they get paid less and they take time out to have kids. So whether it, and there's no paid leave, by the way, here. So um, they take time out to have kids. Unlike they, in other countries. Unlike other countries. An and they lose time this. in the workforce. They lose paychecks in the process. They don't get promoted and they don't get paid like their coworkers. So when you look at women's rights in this country, they are everybody's issues. There are family issues and everything else because it's women who ultimately end up supporting their kids, supporting their family, supporting themselves, and oftentimes elderly parents on their one paycheck. Mm. Wow. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you very much for this amazing conversation. I have a question about, um, I, I want to go back to the issue of feminism and how to think about the history of feminism and things like that. So the question that I have is, um, to what extent the women in politics, not only Hillary Clinton, but other women are feminists or recognize feminism as, um, as something that they should owe to, to their position and things like that? Because uh, the history of feminism in this country is very interesting because it didn't go into the organized um, state political institutions. It remained, it remains, it seems to be outside. It's like grassroots movement and it uh, sees itself as outside of the state, broadly defined. Whereas in places like Norway, as a political scientist, some political scientists argue, feminist political scientists argue that the success of feminism and the success that brought more women to the parliament was directly um, due to the fact that the feminist movement, um, grassroots movement, uh, spilled into the, um, uh, the institutions, oh. institutions of the state. Yeah. So I'm just wondering the extent, I, I think it's a dream to have the grassroots movement that wants to be outside of the state because something that is outside of the state seen as very um, free and uh, not being constrained by anything if there is a way to kind of broaden it and, and sort of utilize the platforms that women in politics have with the ideas and other aspects of women, women's movements that remains vibrant and yet still outside of the political, the organized politics. Mm -hmm. We talked about the ERA yeah. earlier, which is a great example. <laughs> When the ERA came around, and they would read the text of the ERA to people, and I should be able, maybe you can recite it, I can't anymore, but I can't remember the exact wording, but essentially it said women should not be treated differently by virtue of sex. Right. Let's just sum it up that. When they read that <laughs> statement to people, vast majorities of the country said, of course. When they said, do you support the ERA? I said, no, no, the ERA is bad. No, no, a oh, feminist, oh, they hate men. Or, you know, whatever. And then, you know, the dumb, everyone's walking around with t-shirts that say women need men like fish need bicycles and whatever. It just got so ugly and unfortunate and, you know, I don't hang out with men who don't respect women because I don't want to. Because if you don't respect, you know, to me, if you don't respect women, you're probably mean to your dog, too. And you're probably mean to your, anyone from a different religion, anyone from a different race, anyone with a different, you know. <laughs> My sister, she, she doesn't like these divisive times. She finds them very, very stressful. And the thing she keeps saying is very simplistic, but she's very bright. She was valedictorian at Williams. I'm not saying she's not, but she said, why can't people just be nice to each other? It's not that hard. And the baffling thing about feminism to me is why can't, you know, a, a lot of you, I assume, are engineers or studying some kind of science. If you do it well, I want to identify you. Uh, say one of you is I, OK, I'll use a friend of mine who is a, studying at grad school in Columbia. He's developing this 3D printing thing to try to create a new retina. I don't know if that can work. But it's his research thing and whatever. 
Do we want to remember that he happens to be Chinese? Is this the relevant point? Do we have to remember that he's male? No, I think the retina is the cool point. I don't care, you know, and there's this thing in America where we like to put people in boxes. And, you know, I don't want you to identify me by a litmus test or my demographic. I want you to say, oh, there's Ellen. Now you can say, I like Ellen. I don't like Ellen. But I don't want you to say, oh, she's a woman. She lives in New York. She, you know, I don't want you to pull me down to tiny little details. In America, we're so busy categorizing instead of just saying, there is a person. And I think that's part of what feminism got so caught up in just turmoil and stress and angst and the fellas didn't like it much, I gotta say. And that, that really hasn't helped. I mean, now I think when I talk to people who are 17, 18, guys seem to be much nicer <laughs> and much less, like it doesn't seem to be coming up in the way that it did. And so I think progress is being made, but there's another. To yeah. your point, I mean, so the ERA is the Equal Rights Amendment. The most difficult political thing to do in this country is to amend the Constitution. Nearly impossible. But people felt, and the feminist movement in particular felt, that was the way to go, right? To try to amend the, the Constitution of the United States to ensure that women would be treated equally as men. They couldn't even get it enough signatures in each state to get the Constitution amended. So, and that, that, that effort was going on through the late 80s and still failed. There is talk again of trying to resurrect it. So to go back to your point earlier, one, electing more women is going to help that and, and having more women in government, in, in elected office, because that's power, okay? I mean, I would say that about businesses and everything else, first and foremost. But the, the economic argument I made just before you asked your question is the way it's really being spoken about now, because those are the facts. And I think the more people argue the economics of it, and then um, pass laws and legislation to ensure pay equity, to ensure paid leave, because those are family issues, not necessarily just female issues, then that's more likely to be successful. I mean, disheartening to have this conversation in 2015, depressing, but that's politically, that's probably what has to happen. And just having more women in Congress, more women in the United States Senate, and hopefully a woman in the White House at some point soon. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious to see what happens in 10 or 20 years because all the numbers are saying there are now more significantly more women in college than men. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? Because if you have more women than men getting the graduate degrees and becoming the doctor, I mean just more, I would have to assume but there that's going to be women. Like, but, but no, yeah, but this, right. you know, having the running Wall Street, running this, running that. Not that they're going to get rid of men, because of course they aren't, but um, <laughs> that, I realize that could be coming out wrong. But so, we could move more towards parity. Yeah, I also think it's really interesting to think about the history of which issues got pegged as women's issues and got a, got a lot of energy around them politically. And while I am a big believer in women's right, to, reproductive rights and all these things, I think in a lot of ways the fact that abortion became the yeah. issue was incredibly polarizing and yeah. that unfortunately, like I feel like th obviously the economics one is a much more winning proposition, right? It's hard to deny, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So I feel like it's also interesting to look back at the history and see what got traction when and how that you know contributed, I feel like. I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. I think a lot of women in particular, I mean, tell me one procedure a guy has that they have to go to Congress about. No, I know. <laughs> you know I'm right there with you. I'm just saying, I, okay? Right. And I think that, and so I think many women thought, if I can't decide what I am going to do right. from head to toe, then that's pretty basic. Yeah. And yet that's the debate we're still having. I know. Yeah. I know. I don't deny it. But yeah. I, think it was, I think it was problematic politically in yeah. terms of other things well, not getting done. Women, like, well, because religious. of the right, because of the yeah. evangelical right, yeah. Yeah. Without that factor, right. Yeah. 
Hi, thank you guys so much for coming. This has been really fun. Um, I have two questions and they're sort of related and they're kind of more on the representation angle of this presentation. Um, one is I'd love to get your uh, comments on thoughts about um, quotas for women in government. I know some governments around the world are experimenting with that and I'm curious what you think about mm. that. And then on another slightly different angle, I write a lot about um, representation of girls and women in toys and books at, for young kids, so I'm really appreciative of what you've been doing on that. And actually, I'm a former baseball player myself, so I'm going to have to read that <laughs> book that you did. Um, so I'm curious if you could talk about your thoughts on whether things are getting better in terms of specifically political realm of seeing um, girls in positions, whether they're like the lead character, um, you know, whether they're shown in toys. I, you know, I do a lot with talking about girls in the STEM fields, but I'm curious if you talk a little bit about your experiences and your, you know, perceptions of whether things are getting better, staying the same, getting worse in the last 10, 20 years. Well, Gina Thanks. Davis has her, I'm sure you're, yeah, uh, she's doing her big media project, which she came to, I think, mostly after A League of Their Own. I, I think she became very concerned. And, she's, and I guess she had small children, and she looked at movies and television and realized, there are no little girls in any of these scenes, or there's one little girl in the back, and it's all little boys doing the things. And she got Hollywood to start, Disney start throwing in little girls so that it could look more like the actual world looks. Um, which would, and it's sort of shocking that that would be considered progress, but it is. And I think toys now you can, Except, it, I think it just came up with the Marvel movies that there are no toys of Black Widow doing anything interesting. I think Black Widow comes with outfits. And Captain America and the others come with hammers and things. And so that's kind of depressing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your research focuses quite a lot on that kind of thing. Well, um, was, there's also like the book Cinderella Ate My Daughter, right? Which is a really amazing book if you haven't read it. I really love it. And one of the things that, that she talks about is, ha is that the Disney princess thing is a pretty recent phenomenon and that it actually got worse in terms of how women and girls were depicted in the 80s and 90s, which is kind of interesting, right? That in fact, we had been making progress thanks to feminism and then all of a sudden we came to this cultural moment where we started going backwards on these things and it was nice to see Target saying that they were gonna stop doing the gender you know because I think people are starting to really push back against how pink and blue our culture is thanks to you know Peggy Ornstein and thanks to other people drawing attention to this so hopefully we're gonna try and retrench and, and get better again but it's interesting that we had that getting better getting better getting better and then like going backwards I mean I, I would point to two things one um, South by Southwest the hip cool going on in Austin, right? Um, and the gamers, and the bullying of women oh, gamers. Yeah. Absurd. And yet, their answer to that was to just drop the panel, both of them. And it wasn't until Catherine Clark, the congresswoman from here, who called them out on it, and Recode and a bunch of other um, folks started boycotting South by Southwest. So this is South by Southwest, right? The hip, cool, happening, everybody kills themselves to go there because you're supposed to be seen. Cutting edge technology, design, art, culture, politics, music, all of it can't deal with the fact that women gamers get bullied and, I mean, savaged to the point where they feel that their, their lives are threatened. And their answer was to drop the two segments until a woman congressman from Massachusetts challenged them on it. So that's depressing. <laughs> although, on a, on a slightly cheerier though, although I'll hijack you a little bit here, but I maybe play a couple of war games online, maybe kind of actively. And in the, one of the war games I've been playing for about seven years, uh, <laughs> and whenever I show up online, they're like, how come you're not working on your damn book? And I'm like, oh yeah, good point. Uh, but the interesting thing, I play, a very aggressive war game called King of the World, where people are out for blood. And there can be some ugly male, female stuff. Oddly enough, 
the, I've been in the two most, we're the number one alliance right now. Um, and I used to be the other number one alliance. And other play, the male players started noticing both these alliances were totally female dominated in the leadership. The soldiers were mostly men. The leaders, the commanders were almost all women. And we were the two, because I jumped from Hitman to bounty hunters. We were the two top alliances in the game. And because a lot of smart people play this game, and it's a very social game, actually, and people from all over the world play, there's a lot of talk about, isn't this interesting that the women are like the fierce leaders of the game, and we never see this. And language started, people started behaving better when they suddenly realized, oh, hey, they're running, they're running the game here. They're dominating this. And you know, in my alliance, because three women are the top players in the alliance, and, and we have two guys on our admins as well. But look, there's language you can't use in our thread, because we don't like it. Mm -hmm. and the guys are very nice about it. Every now and then, one of them will use a questionable word. And they will actually say, Ellen, June, Teresa, is this OK? <laughs> Did I go too far? Um, and I, you know, because there is all kinds of, the other game I play is much more anonymous. And a couple of times, there's a lot of attacking. I got attacked by a player. And he was, the player was ranked much higher. And so I just sent a polite note saying, you know, is this really kosher for you to attack a newbie? And he, was really rude to me, and I wrote back to him. He's somewhere in England. And I said, you know, I'm a woman. I'm rather offended by what you just wrote. And he said, oh. And, at the, and he was very nice about it. But I thought, that's terrible that he would treat anyone that way. And then this chivalry kicked in, which isn't quite what we're looking for. I think we're looking for equality, not chivalry. But it's but interesting that just my experience in games is just because I don't have any research knowledge. I don't have any theoretical knowledge. I just play the games. And it's been a, you know, a very strange experience. Also, I've done female sports report, uh, photography. And guys, actually doing this, we had an event recently where the Yankees were coming. It was autistic children, like, OK, the Yankees are coming. Andrew Miller is going to be the big guy. Well, of course, it was A-Rod who showed up. Suddenly, male reporters came from everywhere and actually started hitting me. Physically, hit. I'm standing there with the camera and knocking me down. This and that, I'm thinking, wow, this is a strange world we live in. That these guys think it's OK to come and physically knock me down. Of course, I jumped in front of them and you know, um, said, hey, autistic children, leave me alone. But it's a very strange phenomenon of this interaction within game and sport. and. I mean, just before you go, I just would add one thing. I think it's much easier for everybody and everything when you see people like you in positions and things that you want to do, right? So yeah. whether it's in pop culture or books or TV or movies or sports or politics, if you see somebody like you, it's easier to imagine that you could be that person. Mm -hmm. Did Madame Curie lead to a bunch of female scientists? It predates pretty much everyone in the room, but wouldn't you think it would have? It, I thought at MIT, someone would be able to jump right in with an answer on that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But if we had the publicity agent. But if we had the equivalent have right now. Been waiting yeah. and waiting. Oh. I have a political question. I just came from a meeting, and given that Hillary will be the Democratic candidate, <laughs> uh, two running mates were suggested that I just wonder your thoughts on. One was Elizabeth Warren. One was Deval Patrick. Discuss. For Discuss. her, for vice president, yeah. uh -huh. if she were on the ticket for president. You know, you'd like to think that two women could be on the ticket at the same time, but that would just be so mind-bendingly exploding. But um, Bill Clinton, obviously, did something similar when he picked Al Gore, two Southerners, right? And they thought you couldn't elect two people from the South. Um, I mean, I've certainly heard both those names, right? Um, but I've also heard... Julian um, Castro. Julian Castro, yeah. um, maybe Tim Kaine, Virginia, somebody like that. So I think the question is, in the general election, no one votes for vice president, right? You vote for who the president is. But oftentimes, people pick a vice president to address uh, either political or demographic issue they're trying to gap. So Obama picking Joe Biden was smart. 
no matter whatever Joe Biden has said or done over the years, um, it was smart politics for him, right? White, Irish Catholic, you know, blue collar background, all those things, very helpful, especially at that point in the campaign when he picked him. I think all of them would be great. I mean, and I think whether it's Elizabeth Warren or, you know, Deval Patrick, I, I, put, I don't think I'd put Deval Patrick in the same, no. I'd put Elizabeth Warren first. I would, I, um, if I were gonna try to hit that, I'd go with Cory Booker uh, myself. You know, I think Tim Kaine, I mean, things like that. Um, there, there'll be a lot of options. Castro's obvious for obvious reasons. Latino, trying to get Latino votes. I actually think Elizabeth Warren would pull in a shocking number of votes, even though people don't vote for vice president. She speaks to people right now. It, it, like, she's the right person for the times. I don't know, if I were here, it's such a weird year. But I would probably roll the dice, and if Elizabeth would say yes, which I'm not so sure she would, um, I'd probably go for it, because Tim Kaine is the sensible pick. But I don't know. That would be a traditional pick. Yeah, that would be the that would be the, the obvious pick. Um, I mean, I'm not sure Elizabeth Warren doesn't bring a state with her that you weren't already going to get your But you just get this sense of the plain speaking, plain talking. It's what's drawing people to Bernie in a passionate way because he's shooting from the hip. And she, she you know, I think if I were Hillary, I would roll the dice and totally take Elizabeth Warren if she could say yes. And I would give her as an Al Gore level of power. You know, I'd say here are some, here are income inequality, there you go. Um, that's yours. To, you know, I would do that. Would it be smart politics? It would be very, very risky. It would be entertaining. <laughs> it would be exciting. I'm not sure it would work, but personally, I think it would be brave and bold and really interesting. So Ellen, can I ask you, has all this, an actual female candidate, as a final question, is this leading you to want to expand the President's Daughter series? Um, well, you are. You know, I'm probably writing a sequel. Are but, you? Yeah. Okay, but, good. Uh, but if any of you have read the book, it, there's a different main character, and it'll be late in the second term. Fabulous. So, so we can all look forward to that. Yeah, it's not imminent, but it's... Excellent. There would be gaming too much. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I always get caught. Yeah, they always nail me. I said, "What are you doing? You shouldn't mm -hmm. be playing the game." Okay. Any final questions from you all? Or are we ready? Would a dream election be Carly Fiola against Hillary? No. No, that would be the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> um, so a woman, just not that one. Um, <laughs> I would judge her as I would judge any candidate in that. I think before you run to, for president, you ought to have held office. It's a pretty low bar. Um, <laughs> well, I think the Republican and, nominee likely is somebody who's not held office. I, and if it is someone who's held office, I think she's not an unlikely VP pick. Um, if her numbers hold up. So Marianne, if you really think Trump could get the nomination? God. I do. You do? I do. Yeah, I have for about two months now. What, and can you say why? So I think people have vastly underestimated him and vastly underestimated how angry people are in this country about Washington and Wall Street in particular. And again, I don't agree with much, if any, of what he says, mm -hmm. but I understand what he says and why people find it appealing. Yeah. And every time I was on TV and everyone I was on with, including Republicans, said, oh my God, did you hear what he said? That's gonna cost him 10 points. He went up 10 points, right? So he, he's much savvier than people are giving him credit for, number one. Number two, when you look at the polling, everybody who supports him are with him, period, of his, end of sentence. They're not looking at anybody else. When it, whereas when you look at Ben Carson, right, I understand his appeal, especially in Iowa. His book and his, it's been part of homeschooler curricul curriculum for 20 years. <laughs> Homeschoolers are huge in Iowa, as are evangelical Christians. Um, so I understand his appeal and why he's doing well. Um, but his, about a third of his support, his supporters say, you know what, we c I could vote for somebody else too. So his support's more soft. And then if you look at every time Trump has gone after another opponent, you know, Jeb Bush, I mean, he smelled 
blood in the water with Jeb Bush, and he started calling him low energy. And he has a very strategic, savvy way of getting the weakest point of his opponent and going after it and tipping him over. And that was, if you watch, that's when Jeb really started to tank, right? He's gone after Marco Rubio. He's gone after Carson. He doesn't want to knock out Carson. He wants to knock him down a little bit. Because if he knocks him out, up comes Ted Cruz. And Ted Cruz is the guy sitting there like a shark in the water, waiting for Trump and Carson to just collapse, which I don't think they are. But he's just trying to, you know, he's the shark looking for the chum. And he wants them to do it, and he's running out of time. So I, I'm, if Trump wins Iowa and New Hampshire, he runs the table. He's the nominee, period, end of sentence. No one's going to stop him. He won't, you can't. No one can stop him. And, and, and I had said. Are you all shocked? I like sitting here shocked. Yeah. yeah, well, it's very interesting. I'm not interesting. surprised. Yeah. <laughs> but it's. But it, it, too, too horrible to be. Confused. But yeah. relevant to our conversation. Tweet that me we, on March 1st, ah, okay? <laughs> that one of the things that he does that's horrible is sexism. And as yeah. we've already discussed, this is one of, the, one of the free areas of American culture. Like, you can get away with it. And also, I think I was very struck watching the Democratic debates that. Bernie Sanders has put income inequality on the table in a way that was is so unprecedented. I feel like in the last couple election cycles, and you're sort of saying that Trump is kind of banking on that same level of anger about inequality, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the Republican primary process. So, you know, women are can be collateral damage. I mean, I did a segment of Fox a week ago Monday, and it was about Carly Fiorina and The View and how the, girl, the women on The View criticized her appearance and her face and were very, they were terrible about it, right? So yeah. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I was very critical of the women on The View. However, I did take the opportunity to remind everybody about what Carly Fiorina said about Barbara Boxer when she ran against her and her appearance when she ran against her in the Senate race, you know, five years ago and lost to her. So women are other women's worst enemies, right? And, you know, you can't be a hypocrite too. Yeah. So there's a lot of that going on. I, what, I, what you're seeing with Trump, again, people have, he's very shrewd. He's now bringing his wife with him to the debates. Before it was his daughter, who he's featured in many things out in events. His two sons accompanied him yesterday to New Hampshire. I mean, he's very methodically and systematically rolling out his family. Um, all these big events he's been doing, everybody's like, oh, he's just doing big rallies. Yeah, he is, and you know what? He's getting nomination paper signatures, so he's on every ballot in every state, in Texas, in Alabama. Look at the places he's done rallies. They've got their nomination signatures. He's got a real organization, and he has spent the least amount of money in the campaign and on TV of anybody, yet he's a front runner. So I think, again, it's very easy to sit there and say, oh, pst, pst. he's run a very smart, smart campaign, and you may disagree with everything that comes out of his mouth, but a lot of people in this country agree with him. Yeah. Wow. I hate that to be the final note <laughs> of our conversation, but I feel. <laughs> but I feel. Twenty twenty percent or twenty five percent wins you every contest in a ten person race right now. And in March, it's winner take all. I'm not talking. I'm talking about the nomination. It'll be if it's Clinton Trump, it'll be a. A celebrity death oh, yeah. match pay per view and closer than you give know. us a prediction. Well, I would have thought that. Give us a prediction. Guarantee you. Do I think that? Well, if it is, I think she wins, but I think it is an epic brawl. See, you're giving me a better way to end. Though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, and thank Thanks. you, audience, for coming. <laughs>